a neuroradiologist there. And um, if any of you have received your MRI reports from the University of Chicago, his name has probably been at the bottom of it. I have seen his name on half of your, if you're in the DNA and tissue bank, half of your MRI reports at least have had his name at the bottom of it. And then he's going to tell us what it is that he sees when he looks at your pictures. Thank you. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for uh, having me here. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? Oops. I'll make sure I got the controls here. I, I made sure they include the McDonald's signs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, the, the mulberry too. All right, so uh, when, we, uh, when we do image, when we we do image and acquire images and pictures of the brain. Uh, we do it for a reason. Uh, so one is to diagnose, uh, and, it, and the, what would present you to uh, uh, for imaging would be something like a headache or a loss of consciousness or a seizure. Um, another thing is if we already know there's something there, we may <coughs> do imaging for treatment and planning or for follow-up. The methods we use, we uh, when we do imaging, we want to do anatomic imaging, identifying where something is, what the brain looks like, what the effects are, and so on. What the blood vessels look like, we call PGO architecture, so the blood vessel architecture. Uh, the hemodynamics of the brain, how blood moves in and out. And then the functionality of the brain, whether uh, uh, the brain activates or uh, whether bloods are I mean, blood vessels are leaking or whether there's uh, iron accumulation, for example. Now, uh, what I want to do today is uh, talk about what neuroradiologists do when they look at MRIs and CTs. Uh, what I'll do is I'll talk about how a CT scanner works, how an MRI works, I'll, I'll try my best, and uh, then how we use CT and MR to look at CCMs, cerebral cavern stuff. So we, when we uh, do the radiology, we go through an image analysis process. So first thing we do is we try and identify the abnormality. We want to find out where something is. We then want to characterize it. So we look at where it is, and then we look at the different features that it has. So uh, we, we think of uh, clever ways of describing it that may be useful in identifying characterizing something, whether it has a little hat or it looks like a wolf, for example. <laughs> but uh, then after we characterize and localize it, we try and figure out, well, what could it be? What are the possibilities? Because after all, what we're seeing is an image, an impression of what it is. We don't actually, we don't have the pathology in front of us. We don't have the specimen. So we're indirectly seeing it. So we provide a differential as to what it could be. And sometimes it, we have a good chance of being correct. But after, after that, uh, we try and help guide treatment. Use the images to be useful, and to provide some value. And the other thing it can do is it can also determine whether there's been any response to treatment as well. So those are things that we try and do. So when we image, when we image, we there are two big things we think about when we when we do it. One is the ability to see something. So contrast resolution. So the contrast resolution is defined as the ability to discriminate between two adjacent structures, one next to each other. And the spatial resolution, meaning what's the smallest you can see? And the two go hand in hand because sometimes um, you, if some, something can be more conspicuous, uh, you can see uh, smaller objects. So image, so contrast resolution is the ability, if you notice the sentence here, you notice how some of the letters will come in and out depending on the contrast resolution. And that's what I'm talking about, contrast resolution. So some of the images when we acquire them um, can, uh, some of the acquisitions of the imaging can vary depending on contrast resolution. Now, first we'll talk about CT, then we go to MRI. So contrast, resolution on CT depends on density. It's specifically electron density or the atomic number. The differences in the brain tissue are not that much, a few percent. 
I mean, this is, uh, you know, so CT is a little bit of an older modality, but um, sometimes you need to uh, read into it a little bit. So when someone's in a CT scan or an X-ray tube and detectors rotate around very rapidly, sometimes multiple detectors. And an X-ray beam goes through the patient, goes through, the, uh, through whatever, whoever we're imaging, and detectors on the other side, and it rotates rapidly. And depending on the density, uh, it will assign a different value to it. And assign a different value, and they come up with a picture. So as someone goes through, we can acquire slices through the head, in this case, um, and we acquire a number of slices, consecutive slices through the head. This is a slice through the head, a little bit larger than the other ones we're seeing. And you can see that um, the brain has gray matter and white matter, and it has spinal fluid inside it. The dark area is spinal fluid. The white area is bone here. It's the, uh, so that has calcium, so it's denser. So the bone's denser, it's going to appear brighter on the CT scanner. But you notice how the brain tissue, the brain tissue here, does, um, has a, only a slight difference, and that's a CT scan. That's the ability of a CT scan. Now we can give contrast through a vein. It goes through the blood vessels, which also go up in the brain, and it can make something stand out more. It can give us enhance that contrast resolution. It can also enhance our ability to see blood vessels too. So we can also do a CT angiogram with contrast. So there are different things that the we can do to manipulate the CT scan to see certain structures better. Now, there are a few CT scanners have changed over time. Uh, and CT scans uh, first started in the 1970s, and they've uh, changed over time, and they've become a little more sophisticated since that time. The algorithms to reconstruct the images and then how they're acquired and the detectors have improved and so on. So this is a, a scanner, a scan taken in the coronal plane, the coronal plane. And, but with multi-plane, with a multi-detector CTs, in other words, we acquire multiple slices at the same time, in a spiral fashion, we're able to reconstruct in, not just in the axial plane like we saw earlier, but also in the coronal and sagittal plane. By doing this in spiral imaging, and that way we can uh, we can reconstruct images potentially with fewer artifacts. All these lines here are artifacts coming from teeth, from metal teeth. So, so um, that's one of the advantages of multi-planar reconstruction. Multi-detector uh, uh, CTs can have also improved the way that we look at blood vessels, because so we can scan through them much faster. So you can see we can do these reconstructions here we, where we can look at the blood vessels with a very good spatial resolution. We can also do perfusion imaging, watch the, the blood flow in and out of the brain. So that can be useful under certain circumstances. So these are all things that we can do we can, uh, uh, when we acquire a CT image. And you can see we can, uh, nowadays with the multi-detector CT, we can get very nice reconstructions of the head. For example, uh, when a uh, doctor, or, uh, or some a surgeon, any surgeon, would uh, remove part of the skull and put it back in, uh, they may need to fashion uh, something along the, the skull so that it fits better. And, uh, you can use these uh, these CT scanners to um, print out you know, print out the uh, piece of the, the skull. Now, in, uh, typically, the um, in dentists use uh, this type of technology to reconstruct uh, uh, teeth, and surgeons uh, use it to reconstruct uh, uh, people following. Uh, a trauma, so we can do a better job of, uh, of uh, preparing for the surgery. Uh, now, a newer technology that's available is a dual energy or multiple energy CT. So we have multiple detectors, but we can also uh, 
detect x-rays at different energy levels now. And this is uh, newer, but what that allows us to do is distinguish different uh, chemicals in the brain. We distinguish calcium in water and uh, gadolinium better. So it's not just density now, it's also uh, the, uh, it's a, the, uh, what they call the, the K edge. But what, basically what it does, it helps us distinguish, gives, get a better distinction between uh, different uh, tissues and structures in the brain, uh, whether it's uh, calcium or uric acid or, or what it is. So that's what, what it does. It also helps us reduce artifacts from metal. And, um, and it can also give us uh, subtract out bone when we're doing angiograms and uh, gives us nicer pictures. And it can also uh, uh, reduce time by uh, subtracting out iodinated contrast. So this is, uh, uh, this, these are scans of someone who has uh, a little bit of contrast in here. And uh, the way we know this is contrast in our blood, because blood and contrast are both white, is uh, that we can uh, we use this dual energy CT to distinguish between iodine and blood products. And that way, we if, if we can subtract up the iodine from here, this is the image we get. So this is iodine. And that's just one way spectral CT can be used. And also be used to differentiate uric acid that comes with gout versus calcium that comes with other uh, types of lesions that can help us with the differential. And it can also reduce artifact. Notice the artifact in this picture and less artifact on these two pictures from the metal that's in this uh, person's jaw. MRI is, uh, is slightly different. Some people say it's more akin to magic. But um, it just means we don't understand it. So, all right, so um, what we're imaging, when we image on MRI, so on CT, we image the density of something. When we image on MRI, we image hydrogen in water. We predominantly image, and we also image hydrogen in fat, but mainly we're imaging hydrogen in water. So we're imaging hydrogen protons in the water. Now, um, that's what most uh, commercial MR systems are, are tuned into. Now, how does this work? Well, we have these water protons have a magnetic moment. So if you think all atoms, uh, all electrons just spin around, the protons inside the atom spin around and have a magnetic moment. They have a mag sort of a magnetic field, so to speak. Now, if you put someone in a magnetic, the magnet, their protons will line up with the magnetic field, sort of like this, or like that. So it lines up with the magnetic field. Now, once they line up, and that's what this cube is, we can apply a radio frequency pulse. So we deposit energy here again, a radio frequency pulse, like radio waves. And that goes through an antenna. And the antenna could be either next to the head or, or somewhere close by in the back of the table. But with the brain, we tend to have a, an antenna that's closer to the head. We apply that. What that does, it goes at the resonance frequency of the water proton. So it gets absorbed and it displaces these protons. So they're no longer aligned with the magnetic field. Then we turn that off and then it, it absorbs that energy and then it has to send it back. And the, what MR does, is just listens, listens to that energy coming back after, after you've applied the radio frequency pulse. That's what it does. So we have, uh, we're imaging water hydrogen protons in a magnetic field by sending out radio waves. And we, they're absorbed and what we do is hear what's coming back. And there are different ways to localize it and so on, and localize where it's coming from and so on. So it's fairly sophisticated. One thing was when we acquire on MR, we can acquire in multiple planes um, directly. And we also can, we can also do different sequences. We can image in different ways. So the way that we apply the radio frequency pulse, or pulse says, I should say, uh, will determine what type of image comes out. And we can, and it focuses on different characteristics of the tissue. 
the way, basically the way it absorbs and releases the radio frequency pulse, this proton. In that way, what that translates into is a large variety of imaging sequences, and so many that we can't apply all of them on one person in one city, because it will take literally, uh, it will take many, many hours to do that, imaging all sequences. So we have to tailor the MRI image accordingly. So here we have a T1 weight image, uh, a proton density image, T2 image, flare images, a kind of standard sequences. These are susceptibility images that identify blood more strongly. This is diffusion, you can image diffusion. These are all without contrast. In addition, contrast, there are different things we can do with contrast too on MRI too. So we can image the contrast that leaks out, but we can also image how it leaks out and how it uh, perfuses the tissues, how the blood perfuses the tissues. So there, we have many more choices on MR than we do on CT. We can also do spectroscopy, in other words, interrogate chemicals in the brain, which represent what the membranes in the cells are doing, or the energy state, or, or how, you know, whether there are lots of neurons in that area, or whether there's uh, you know, what the uh, metabolism of the, of the tissue is in that area, those chemicals that we're trying to do. And we can generate maps. For example, this uh, choline map would represent the membranes of the tissues. So what's the concentration of membranes and cells in that area? We can try and assess that uh, that way. In addition, we can uh, look at white matter tracks. So white matter tracks. So neurons talk to each other through axons, through white, you know, basically white matter tracks. So it's equivalent of having a wire from one neuron to another. And we can map those out. And that can be useful if you're operating on someone. If you know where those tracks are. If you cut the wires, well, it's the equivalent of uh, getting rid of uh, uh, the neuron, too. So, because that's the connection. It's a critical connection. Now, there's, there, there, there are trillions of connections in, in the brain so that you can reroute itself. But uh, nonetheless, um, we can we can map these out, and these these can be fairly critical. Sometimes. Functional MR is uh, basically means that we can identify areas that uh, activate in the brain too. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit further. But uh, we can image someone when they're resting, when they're watching a movie, for example, or they're doing something, moving a finger or something. And we can uh, uh, image what part of the brain controls that. Now, MRIs come in with different field strengths, too. You need weaker field strengths, stronger field strengths. And a lot of times for certain types of uh, entities, uh, higher field MRIs are better because they give us greater detail. And higher field MRIs may cause more artifacts for other entities. But for cavernoma specifically, the higher field MRIs um, give us more information. Live. All right, so let's compare CT and MR. CT actually has better spatial resolution. You can see smaller structures, slightly smaller structures. Although now um, there's a competition. Because, but MR has better contrast, tissue contrast resolution. So the ability to discriminate between two adjacent things is better on MR. That's generally why uh, a lot of people like it. Um, MR tends to be a longer exam and makes people more claustrophobic uh, than CT. CT is a, obviously a faster exam. CT actually is a better evaluation of the bones, it makes the bones stand out. MR, you're imaging water, hydrogen, protons, and the calcium in the bones does not have water in it, it has very little water in it. So you're not, you can't image it as well as you would on CT. MR is also more expensive because the upkeep and so on is, is, uh, is, is greater. Plus uh, there's a, a uh, greater throughput with CT than, uh, than in MR. It takes longer to get MR. It uses, uh, 
liquid helium, which costs money, and then there are all sorts of precautions that go along with that. But let's, um, so cavernous malformations, which you're probably familiar with at, at this point, but just a review, they're basically low flow vascular malformations. So the, it's a lesion that has low blood flow. And basically, it's a bunch of tightly packed vascular channels. And it looks like, looks exactly like this. It also looks sort of like a mulberry. And it's relatively unusual, 90% of malformations. And some are, um, some run in families, and some are sporadic, don't run in families. And when we're imaging, there are features that we can look into that could potentially tell, uh, tell us what it is. Now we have a CT scan of one that uh, right here is hyperdense here. Usually when it's hyperdense, we think it may have hemorrhaged recently, uh, but sometimes it's because it has calcium which is very dense for other reasons. Uh, in this case, it comes in multiples, but there are different pulse sequences. You can see they all look different. This is susceptibility imaging sequence. It makes the lesions look a little bit bigger. And uh, this is a T1, this is a T2. <laughs> but basically what we can use T1, T2, Flaramari, and so on is to uh, uh, try and get a general idea of whether the blood products in it are new or old or, or you know, the, you know, what stage they're at. And uh, there are certain characteristics that uh, that a uh, cavernoma has. So we said mulberry in pathology, it looks like a mulberry when you take it out. Now on imaging, it looks more like popcorn. Imaging is black and white. So, um, you know, popcorn is black. Um, so on CT, we see it only about, <laughs> and we can see one about 50% of the time before it's present, relative to MR. So it's best seen on the susceptibility weight imaging. And uh, that, that, this MR sequence here. And you can see it has this heterogeneous appearance and all, it has, tends to have this black ring around it, hemosiderin ring. Something's black, it either lacks water on MRI or it has blood flow. And in this case, it lacks water and has hemosiderin, which causes what they call susceptibility effect. It looks so black. But to uh, make long story short, the, there, there are certain characteristics that this type of lesion has that makes it very, characteristic. So that's what it looks like when you characterize it as popcorn. You can also do an MR angiogram too to determine if, if uh, um, you know, we're, you know, in case it's not a cavernoma and it's an ABM or something else, sometimes it's a question. It's a question. <clears throat> so cavernoma, it's a developmental venous anomaly and cavernoma are associated in the sporadic for whatever reason it's associated. 30% of cavernomas will have it, and 40% uh, of people with sporadic will have it, and only 1% of familial cavernomas will have it. So we can, we see a developmental venous anomaly associated with cavernoma, or if it's an isolated cavernoma, we tend to think it's probably a sporadic cavernoma rather than a familial. And, uh, if we identify, on the other hand, the developmental venous anomaly, then we should look for an associated cavernoma because, well, uh, developmental venous anomalies tend to not to bleed frequently unless they're associated with the cavernoma or another type of lesion. So developmental venous anomalies have this general characteristic appearance. They call it caput medusa. This is a caput medusa plant here. They look like. And uh, they're anomalous venous drainage, but they drain normal brain, so you can't just remove it and expect that everything's going to be fine. So the veins tend to be thicker. This is a MRI of the T1 weight image of dye. And you can see some of these little projections from the main vein, uh, main vein here. It's an angiogram showing the main vein. In the tiny little caput medusa appearance here, the little vessels here, it sort of looks like this upside down. Again, over here on this T1 rate image of contrast, you can see the vein here. And then there's a there was a cavernoma associated with it. All right. 
Now, this is a, a patient who presented with a, with a, a small hemorrhage in the brain. This is a CT scan where it says CT. And you notice it's slightly hyperdense. Notice how it doesn't stand out that much. They're, you can appreciate why they're harder to find on a CT. You only see them 50% of the time. You see a hemosiderin ring here. See this ring here, it's characteristic. You have this popcorn-like appearance, we call it, if you will. This is a susceptibility weight image. Notice how it looks bigger on it and darker on the periphery. Now, if it's an acute hemorrhage, it, hemosiderin, hemosiderin takes time to deposit. It's late blood. But acute blood is going to be brighter, like, like this, on T2 wave imaging, and also on T1 wave imaging, it's going to be brighter. So we know that this is, has old blood and new blood in it, and the way it's configured with the hemosiderin around it suggests that it's a, a, you know, something like a cavernome. It's got a long hemosiderin. It's a phase image. What a phase image does, it helps us identify with the susceptibility what we're seeing is related to, uh, for example, blood or calcium. And we can see it in multiple planes. So this is the same lesion here, but we can appreciate its relationship to the surrounding structures. Now on CT, cavernomas can present as blood products, as an installation. <coughs> or they can have some calcifications, dystrophic calcifications. This is a patient who had a normal, um, a normal CT of the head, and this, these MRIs of the brains look fairly normal, except for this old dot here. So it's almost like I train to identify my Waldo sometimes. <laughs> but um, but these are, this is a T1-weighted image. It's T1 with conscious, but you notice um, um, kind of bright here, it's got the hemosiderin ring around it, it's a very tiny one. And because it's so small, it's harder to characterize. We can magnify it uh, here so you can see it better. Notice you can't see it on the CT, but you can see it on the other sequences. And it has a similar, generally smaller version of what we saw earlier. Smaller version of what we saw earlier. So it's fairly suggestive of a cavernoma, but it's so small we kind of wonder sometimes. You can follow it. Now, this is one month later, and uh, it got a little bit bigger. Well, how did it get bigger? Well, it, it bleed, that's a little bit bigger. Um, T, it's a T1-weighted image. And you can see that the blood products here, you can see this, uh, are in a, a phase that suggests it was a recent bleed. So we have the comparison here to also tell us that. And again, it's got this this dark ring around it that is expanded, and then it also enhances the contrast. So these sequences kind of tell, date the, the lesion. The susceptibility makes it more sensitive to additional images, that lesion, sorry. We can use a CTA to help identify whether this hemorrhage was, is associated with an other type of vascular malformation. That's the dominant reason we use the angiographic type of images. If it's something other than cavernoma. And uh, this is what the post operative appearance can look like. Notice that uh, the hemosiderin is not as evident on this anymore. But, uh, uh, you know, there's a little cavity immediately after surgery. You can see there's a, looks like there's no, uh, this, this right here is artifact from the plate. But uh, you can see the, almost looks like no one touched the brain in here, but somehow the in here, and uh, I think this one learned after a lot. But um, it almost looks like you didn't touch it. But you know, you're going to take out the lesion, so there's going to be a, where the cavernoma was. There's going to be a little cavity, and that's uh, uh, that's what we see. And then the following the MR is taken to confirm that. Um, now, field. We talked about field strength. So more powerful magnet. We can see smaller lesions with, especially with uh, cavernomas. So this is the same T2 weighted images. But you can see the lesions are more conspicuous on the T on the one, three Tesla versus the 1.5 Tesla image. And that's the point I'm trying to make here is that the more powerful magnets are, are important. And the, Dr. White will insist that all his patients have a PTMI. 
for this for this reason to look for additional insights. It also gives us um, better, um, uh, higher resolution images as well. Now uh, this is uh, we follow the the lesions to see if they got bigger. And in this case, there's one lesion here that got bigger, and that may have implications on whether or not to go ahead and treat. But this is one of uh, a person who had multiple carbonomas, and one of them got bigger, so that's uh, probably the one that they're, that's going to be of concern. Increased in size. <clears throat> Increased in size can cause mass effect and symptoms. So we're comparing here a gradient echo image with an MR. You can see the, the, the susceptibility image uh, is a, it shows the lesions darker than the gradient echo image. Now, both of these are supposed to show blood better. But um, uh, susceptibility weighted imaging is, uh, is a little more sensitive than gradient echo imaging. And you can see this lesion here, you can see it on the gradient echo image. You can see it on both, you can see this one on both. So, so you can see these lesions in both. But um, in this, um, in this case, uh, there's a, another small lesion, for example, which you see much better on the SWI and you're really uncertain whether there is a lesion on, on this uh, gradient echo image. It sort of looks like a blood vessel. So susceptibility weighted imaging is a type of sequence that, uh, that helps us uh, uh, detect smaller lesions. And then again, here we can do a, a maximum, what they call, we can post-process them to make them even more sensitive. This, uh, uh, someone came in with uh, problems talking, so slurred speech for one reason or another, uh, or had episodes of slurred speech. And, and it sees Dr. Awad. This is the first MR. Notice that this became smaller than some of the blood products that were associated with this uh, got absorbed. So the lesion got smaller three months later, so both the T2 wave images. You can, these are magnified here, but you can see the difference in size. And this is two years later, and we continue to follow up. Uh, it looks like it uh, got back to its uh, size it was uh, when, at the first presentation. So you can see it on the CT scan even. And uh, you can see this fluid, fluid level, which we can see in the routine images, in character, is characteristic of, of uh, newer blood. Now, uh, and these are this is a comparison of the first three months and then uh, two years later. And you can see the, the lesions changed character. And you can see there, there's some differences in it. And, uh, and then there's a little more hemocytorin that's deposited around it. Around it. In geography, there was a question whether there was uh, there was a small AGM there, so an angiogram was done to make sure that it wasn't what is an angiogram. When we inject blood vessels with dye and take x-ray pictures, why do we bother doing that? Because the spatial resolution is much higher and it's more sensitive in detecting arteriovenous malformations than a conventional MR or a conventional CT. That's why sometimes we'll do an angiogram. You can get these higher spatial resolution images than you would with, than you could possibly do with CT or <clears throat> So, but the other thing with this particular patient, it looked like the lesion was in some very sensitive parts of the brain. So functional MR, what that does is it, uh, it helps identify brain function, sort of like a mind reader. Now what happens? Uh, so when uh, when a part of the brain activates, when you're moving your legs or talking, certain parts of the brain activate, and they they request more blood flow. So that area of the brain that's talking requests more blood flow, and uh, it dilates up, enlarges, and it exchanges some um, oxygen and hemoglobin. There's more blood flow going there. And basically, what MR does is it detects that change in blood flow when you're 
uh, when that task is being done. So, they, so we call it task-based fMRI, functional MRI. Basically, is a whatever you're trying to test, whether it's talking or or seeing a movie or or uh, moving a finger. There's going to be neuronal activation, and that's going to increase the blood flow, and that can be sensitized on the uh, on the MR on the MRI scan. And the contraptions associated with the functional MR are a little more elaborate because somehow you have to get these tasks to done, have someone produce these tasks without moving their head. You can't move the, the head during the MR scan. So we have these elaborate contraptions that uh, that do that, different uh, screens and so on, and prism glasses, um, uh, schemes for word generation and repeating of, uh, whatever we're doing over and over again. So someone sits in the magnet, they look for a prism. Uh, there may be instructions here, or maybe if it's a visual thing, they may see uh, uh, lights flashing or, or something. If there are instructions here, they'll tell them what to do. Generally, before someone has an fMRI, what we'll do is we'll, we'll do a, a dry run in a different room that's not an MR scanner to, you know, so that they know what to do when they're in the MRI. And then we, in this particular patient, uh, we wanted to determine what the tongue movement is, uh, what center was, where it was in relation to the Caverns malformation, so when they were surgically excised, they would, uh, Dr. Wad would be able to avoid the critical structure. Uh, so, knowing where it is can affect how the surgery is planned. So, in this case, it's a, these are the, the orange areas here represent where the tongue, the tongue movement centers. In this particular case, that was the closest to the reason, probably the reason. This particular person had difficulty talking to us because of the tongue, because of the tongue dysarthria. And here's the lesion where the arrow is. Now, we did other tasks too, sentence completion task. You notice it's far apart from the lesion. Or word generation, it's another task we can perform. Or verb generation, and generally, Dr. Jack Collins from our institution is one who does these. And, uh, it's very meticulous about making sure that uh, it's as accurate as possible. You can also do finger tapping and, and foot movement. Um, and obviously, these are far away from a particular region. But the orange area here is for the finger, and the pink area here is for the foot. Same thing. Identify um, The last thing I want to talk about is uh, one area that Dr. Watts is very interested in. And uh, that's the permeability in cavernomas. Right? So we can do imaging of permeability too. Now, what is permeability? So when blood flows through blood vessels, it can leak out some fluid, right? And it generally does that in the body. Now that can increase depending on what's going on. If there's inflammation or something like that, it can actually increase. Now. In the brain, however, the brain, however, differs in the way it leaks compared to the rest of the body. So it, it leaks much, much, much less fluid. In fact, it tries to be watertight. And the water can't even get through. But it, it can transport some stuff across. Now, so there's a certain level of permeability in the brain. And so this is the, and that depends on the blood barrier and how it's constructed. And I think that Dr. White's area of expertise here is cavernomas and uh, more recent uh, research in, the, uh, in the, the permeability associated with cavernomas has shown that there, there is a association, maybe different in familial versus sporadic in the brain. And it's quite possible that it may affect hemorrhage too as well. So therefore imaging permeability of the brain uh, may be a, a important. May be important. And this is a represents the gloves. This is the brain here. This uh, represents a cross section of a blood vessel. If you take a cross section of the 
wall of the blood vessel. Uh, you have this, and then you take a, a cross section of these cells next to the blood vessel. And you have you can start identifying what keeps water out. And there are very tiny structures inside the blood vessels that that uh, affect the permeability. So we can image permeability. Um, and that may be useful. You know, we can image it by injecting dye and watching the dye leak out over time. We can, uh, this is a signal intensity here, and this is time. We can watch it leak out and develop these maps here. And we can measure it, uh, measure the degree of permeability in the brain. And the idea here would be um, if this uh, connection between permeability and carbon the hemorrhage is, uh, is real. This may help guide treatment and may alter treatment. I think that Dr. White has certain strategies to try and stabilize these uh, uh, the blood barriers um, in this case. Another thing we can do, we talked a little bit about susceptibility. So we can image hemosiderin, which is iron. Now we can actually, we're using MR, we can measure how much iron has leaked out. We call that quantitative susceptibility MRI. It basically does, it measures how much iron is deposited in the tissues. And they may be an indirect measure of how much uh, the cavernoma has been leaking over time. It's been leaking over time. So that may be useful information. All right, so I wanna thank you for listening here, especially with our lunch. Um, we talked a little bit about CT, how it depends on density. We talked a little bit of, uh, of uh, atoms to create an image. We talked a little bit about MR, how it depends on water, the presence of water. And we um, then tried to describe what CCMs look like and how we can assess them using uh, our imaging techniques. In geography, for example, can exclude a, a terabenous or other vascular malformations, and how functional MRI can be helpful too. I think we have a few questions for you already. Um, yes, we do. Well, actually, I'm going to ask mine, mine first. Um, do you, one of the things that we get concerned about with CCM patients is an increase in cancer, brain cancer risk with CT. Do you feel like there's that the pump is primed for cancer with with CCM um, in people going through CT with it. So in other words, should we scale back CTs more and more with folks, especially with the familiar form? Uh, absolutely. So um, if you will, um, what's so the radiation levels on a CT scan are pretty low. Um, so. Um, the cancer, when they talk about CT scanning cancer risk, it differs depending on the tissue that's being imaged. So uh, the persons who are most susceptible to cancer related to CT scan are young women who are getting their lungs imaged, for example, for pulmonary embolus over and over again. You need to accumulate doses over time. Now, the thing with the brain is that it doesn't, you know, the tissues that are susceptible are the ones that divide the fastest. The problem with the brain that we have is that uh, it doesn't, the cells in the brain don't regenerate themselves as effectively as uh, tissues in the rest of the body. As a result, the cancer risk from radiation in the brain is lower. Um, and, you know, repeated head CTs, we don't, uh, would have a, a lower risk. Now the thyroid gland would be one area we'd be worried about. The other thing that we worry about with radiation is actually with the eyes, with the, you know, if you get enough CT scans, a dose of 200 grads over, over time, maybe a, a, a threshold where you can start to develop cataracts from it sooner than, uh, than you would normally. And generally speaking, the cancer risk is not the Top of the list for the CT of the head. It would be if it was the neck, looking at the thyroid, 
or the chest. Um, obviously, the age is going to be important the younger you are. Um, the degree of scatter that you get, um, extra that bounces off the head and so to the chest, for example, is, uh, is uh, low enough so that it's negligible. The next question is was asked by a number of different people because I think we all kind of go through the same thing. We're seen in multiple facilities. And so the question is, the 3T SWI sequence that you do at UCLA versus the University of Chicago versus Columbia Presbyterian, are they close enough? Are they different from each other? What we get told you have to do it on the same machine every time. If you have a Phillips here versus a Siemens there, you can't sure. necessarily compare them. Um, well, you can always compare anything. You can compare apples and oranges. But um, you know, there's some similarities. But what I would say is the way we, we do it, so, so we have a protocol specific for cervical cavity malformations. It's not just the, the SWI sequence, it's, it's also uh, the, the other ones as well. It's the spatial resolution, it's also with, with the QSM, the, the, the quantitative stability means that we have and that we perform. And it's not commonly performed in the specifically for the the protocol. Uh, yes, you can you can compare, and sometimes it's comparable, but it all depends on. Uh, so that, you know, you can compare what they did in the Linux station versus the SWN. It may be close enough. The reason to repeat it in the same place is because it gives you a more um, you do the exact same sequence in the same way over and over again. You get a better comparison. You get a uh, uh, you get less variability based on the type of scanner, less variability based on the differences in the way the sequences are, are set up, and that's um, why there's this uh, somewhat preference to have it to be scanned in the same uh, the same way in the same scanner. Let me complement that because I think. Uh, in some ways, it depends why you are using that. So if you are using it for uh, lesion burden of the larger uh, lesions, it doesn't probably matter what kind of scan. So we can use the fairly accurate use of a T2 lesion. And there will be some studies and some questions that are driven by T2 lesions. And of course, the more broadly applicable, the more advantageous it is to have the scan anyway. But if you're getting into counting dots and altering whether I have a new dot last year, then uh, the more uh, rigorous the, the technique, the less likely you're gonna miss some dots or miscount them. So, uh, uh, it depends how pushy we are toward the sensitivity. And I think, you know, a happy medium uh, might be uh, to guide general clinical decision. I think a 3 MRI with a susceptibility map is going to be the same all across the country. But if you're asking, did I, did I get a new lesion or not, or did my lesion increase by one or two millimeters or not, that could be an error because the test was not done the exact same way. So people would come and say, I was told I have a new lesion. Or my lesion caused my dizziness and it's bigger. And if you really look at them, they really didn't. So, so uh, you know, you're not gonna have a straight answer on this. It depends how we're gonna apply it. Everybody realizes that the more you can use it across platform, the better. Uh, but also the more sophisticated and new the imaging, the less usable a problem. We're dancing between those two all the time. And Permeability then, and QSM are probably impossible to compare unless you validate it very rigorously at the same place. The number is probably not there. And the, the next question, series of questions, was about frequency of imaging. And I'm not sure which of you should be answering that question more, but. Um, people were asking, should we only get imaging when we're symptomatic or should we do it on an annual basis? What if we're post-surgical? How often should we have imaging after that if we have no more symptoms? 
Yeah. Yeah. I'll defer to Dr. White. He's deferring to you. All right. So uh, <laughs> uh, here again, it depends uh, how spastic we are together about the change in your league. Okay. So if you are uh, in a lifestyle where decision making and living decisions and whatever will depend on whether your region change, we recommend surveillance. If you are at a stage where it doesn't matter to you, you don't care unless a symptom comes up, then don't have it be uh, The same is true uh, so that a lesion is watched much more closely if it's changing or if we're going to do something about it, or if you're going to do something in your life based on whether it changed or not. In general, some form of regular imaging is not a bad idea because the patients that come out of the woodwork 10 years after having had no imaging, and they tell me now my lesion is acting up. I cannot tell them if it started acting up yesterday or if it's the same as it was six years ago. And that's a big difference. Because if I had that MRI from six years ago, I could reassure them if I didn't have it, I'm going to have to repeat a couple more before we decide what I'm so here again, we're not giving you a straight answer, but we're giving you a philosophy uh, about it. And certainly if you have new symptoms and we're gonna make decisions based on symptoms, you have to repeat the imaging. If you're not, you don't have. Is that fair? I mean, yeah. Okay, just a few more quick questions. We, we really need to wrap up, but um, open MRIs, are they useful for our folks at all? And then I saw this billboard about vertical MRIs. I in my bird, they don't have that yet. You must have to be in Chicago to get that. So, um, you know, the open MRIs are there for claustrophobia and people who can't fit them regularly. Now, um, having said that, uh, the field strength is important. So, open MRIs tend to be lower field strengths. In addition to that, the smaller the bore, the better the brain imaging. It's, uh, so the ones that the, the larger bore magnets uh, tend to have, a, it, it's a subtle difference. It, it's not that significant. So uh, if you have a, a, a um, if you go through a, a large bore magnet, you may be prone to less claustrophobia. The difference between that and a smaller bore magnet will be subtle. Uh, but um, so if you had a choice between doing an open MR because of claustrophobia and a, uh, uh, you know, regular MR, would, if you could undergo one with uh, the larger bore, then maybe better. It tends to be the more open a magnet is the lower the field stream. That's the reason that it, it, uh, it reduces the sensitivity for One of the problems comes up is you have an open MRI know what your lesion looks like and then there is a problem and you have a closed MRI and then the two are not exactly comparable in millimeter. and this is where some of the issue comes up. I have some patients that really are totally claustrophobic. They cannot have an MRI with the bone pad. They put them asleep to do it and it's not worth it. So if they are not wanting to go all the way to get the susceptibility and whatever, that they can have their MRI on the open, but have it always on the same scan and don't ask for the very specific high information data. We're not going to get that, but we can manage your case. So we make some compromises, but we make decisions. And then the, the last question, and it's absolutely the last question. Um, 3T MRI, um, is it... <clears throat> Is it the latest and greatest? Is there something better coming down the road? Where would we be looking for it? Um, and who decides which images, it, imaging sequences somebody gets? Is it the neurologist, the surgeon, the radiologist? So um, the three test lines, the higher field strength uh, commercially available for routine use. Now there are higher, you know, higher field strengths going up to now up to 10 Tesla. Uh, or being, uh, even now being formed up to 7 Tesla. Um, now that's going to improve uh, susceptibility uh, imaging. 
It will also improve MRAs when you hire a releasing MRAs. However, um, you know, we don't know everything. It's still experimental. There, there are some downsides to the uh, ultra high field strengths uh, because of uh, the way when you go up, when you change the field strength, you actually change the radio frequency you use. And that changes um, what they call the homogeneity of the radio frequency field. That uh, can then make the images uh, <coughs> splotchy looking and not as, uh, you, may, you may run into some problems. In addition, uh, you may run into significant artifacts uh, near the skull base and so on. So there, there may be a downside as well. So in selecting out the higher field strengths, uh, we need some more time to assess that. And it's been available since uh, 1998 in humans, but it hasn't applied to the clinic because of a number of Afternoon speaker, if we could try and get back here at 115, maybe even 110, so we can get started at 115, that would be wonderful. Yes. 